And so uh, I'm glad to be here this afternoon. I'm glad that Covance is a part of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. Uh, and uh, we as a CRO collaborate with many of the folks who are in attendance at this meeting. And so uh, being part of ARM and being able to participate is a great way for us to fur further uh, avenues for collaboration. My talk will be a little bit different. You know, um, we're not um, a developer of assets. We're a CRO. We're a service provider. We help folks um, as they move their assets and molecules through the development cycle and hopefully work with them to ensure the successful filing of their products. What I'll do this afternoon is uh, give you an overview of Covance if you don't know uh, who we are. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about our experience in the cell and gene therapy space. And then I'm going to pivot a little bit and talk about um, an area that I think is uh, extremely important in rare disease, and as we think of gene therapies for rare disease, is how we can leverage data, uh, real world data that comes from a number of sources, uh, mainly though from our parent company's diagnostic uh, offerings that can help us understand uh, the natural history of, of rare disease. And as we think of that and as we choose and identify surrogate endpoints of success, understanding natural history of rare diseases can be a, an extremely important um, uh, aspect of that. So let's see. And the big, the big green one makes it go forward. So Covance, we're a global company. Uh, over the last uh, couple of years, we really had a focus on expanding our footprint in Asia Pacific. I think that's relevant as we heard one of the panel discussions this morning around the focus on cell-based therapies in China and in Asia Pacific. So we have about 25,000 uh, employees worldwide. Uh, we have extensive therapeutic area expertise. And so it's relevant here in the context of this conference. Uh, about 40% of the um, work that we, provi that we provide across our uh, business units is in the oncology space. So we talk about cell-based therapies, adoptive T-cell therapies in cancer. That's relevant. And then we have other expertise in areas ranging from neurodegenerative disorders, uh, to uh, metabolic disease, to um, uh, blood-based disorders, which is relevant in the, uh, the gene therapy space. So again, our lab scientists, our medical directors uh, provide good um, insights and are good partners in that development process. And then if you look at our experience, and again, these type of statements are often true of all of the large CROs, uh, we work across every area from preclinical through clinical development and commercialization of therapeutics. So we have worked on all of the top 50 drugs. And if you look in the area of oncology, you know, over 90% of those drugs have been approved over the last five years. Covance has worked with our partners in one uh, way or another. The thing that really differentiates us, though, in the CRO space is the full suite of services that we offer. So we have a strong expertise in the non-clinical or preclinical space, toxicology, animal models of disease. We have a very, very strong central lab that's global in nature uh, that can develop biomarker assays that are relevant, provide logistics, do safety testing, all of which are important for uh, late stage trials. Our clinical development group, again, being therapeutically aligned with uh, areas that are of interest in this meeting, and then a commercialization organization so that when a therapeutic comes to market like the, the CAR-19 molecules, our commercial group works with payers to ensure that patients who qualify for those therapies have the appropriate insurance coverage. And so we really work from beginning to end. A couple of areas that I didn't highlight on this slide that I think would be of interest for this audience, and uh, I'll learn for the next time, is we off offer a service called Marketplace. And Marketplace is for companies that have an early stage asset, that they're looking for additional investment from a venture fund or maybe a partner with a larger pharma company. So we almost are a matchmaker in that regard for those assets and those individuals or organizations that can help move that molecule along. And then in the cell and gene therapy space or for organizations that may not have 
all of the requisite strategic, regulatory uh, expertise, we offer a, a service called Early Phase Development Solutions. And those, again, are all of those types of services that enable a, an organization to move an asset uh, through and gather all of the relevant preclinical data to have an IND enabling package to submit to the agency. So again, full, full spectrum of, of services uh, with areas that really intersect nicely with um, cell and gene therapy. In our organization, we see uh, cell and gene therapy as the third leg in a stool, all are involved in precision medicine. So we look in the industry now, there's no program that comes forward that isn't driven by a biomarker strategy, whether it be biomarkers that help select patients, whether it be biomarkers that monitor for adverse events. We have a long history of working in the companion diagnostic space, the sort of ultimate biomarker that's necessary for the drug to be prescribed. And then again, in this space, in cell and gene therapy, we actually, in one part of our organization, have worked on all of the four approved uh, cell and gene therapy molecules that have come to market in the last uh, couple of years. So uh, in this space, we've, uh, again, our ex uh, experience spans all of our various business segments. So in the preclinical or non-clinical space, uh, we can support um, biodistribution studies, bio-CMC to qualify the the, uh, the, the molecule that we used in the therapy. We can do animal disease models. We've done things in liver disease, ocular disease, and we've got experience across a wide and a spectrum of, of uh, vectors or delivery mechanisms, ranging from vaccines to oncolytic viruses to lentiviruses and adeno-associated virus. So again, we've got a lot of experience across all of the relevant pieces. In the central lab side, uh, we have, again, a wealth of experience in developing specific biomarker assays that may be relevant once the molecule moves into the clinic. And then, as I mentioned, our clinical and medical expertise cuts across um, a wide spectrum of therapeutic areas. And in this area, particularly cell and gene therapy, as well as in other areas like oncology now, the ability to work in an integrated fashion is relevant because the more you can cut down on the white spaces in the development stages that you have, the better it is for an efficient and potentially successful uh, delivery model and bringing your molecule to uh, a positive registration. Uh, we heard this a lot of the points this morning from Peter Marks and others talking about in the rare disease space, in gene therapy, in advanced therapies in, in general, it's not a one size fits all. So there are often unique development paths. The regulatory pathways are more flexible, whether it be the regenerative medicine and advanced therapies approached by the FDA, accelerated or breakthrough designations. We know that non-clinical data, biodistribution data, preclinical toxicology data, moving into PK studies, as you go from animal into humans are relevant, and natural history, which I'll talk about in a second, is a really critical element of that. And then CMC and the logistics of moving the therapeutic from manufacturer, qualification, and to patients, obviously, is critical as well. So I'll talk a little bit now about uh, real-world evidence and natural history studies. And one of the things that became very evident when Covance and LabCorp came together is we had multiple sources of relevant data for drug development. Uh, we have uh, data for protocol design. So again, we're able to look at inclusion exclusion criteria, for example, in an oncology trial, bounce it up against our real world lab data from LabCorp Diagnostics and see what that, what changing or modifying inclusion or exclusion criteria might do to recruitment and protocol design. We can take a look at our investigative sites in our lab data, and we can point clients to where there is a cache of patients and appropriate investigators to uh, relevantly increase, enro increase enrollment. We're leveraging patient intelligence. LabCorp uh, touches uh, millions of patients in the US. We're, we're um, asking them to participate in survey, surveys around 
what motivates them to be part of a trial and what demotivates them and what, what can be relevant from a patient-centric approach to, uh, to the delivery of a success, uh, successful um, uh, study. Uh, in that regard, we've actually, for all of our patients that go into a patient service center now, we give them an opportunity to opt in to be contacted about participating in a clinical trial. And to date, we have a half a million patients who have volunteered to be contacted uh, if they are eligible for a potential trial. So that's a great connection back to the patient. And then we have a variety of other tools that are relevant. So again, uh, 30 billion lab results reside in the LabCorp database. Many of those are longitudinal in nature. Uh, we have 175,000 clinical investigators in our database within Covance. And again, we can match those up where appropriate. And what we're looking to do is then use real world data to provide insights that really facilitate how uh, trials are done and executed on. So I've got a few minutes here and I'll, talk to the, I'll move to the meat of, the, of the, the discussion that I wanted to talk about. And that is using as a case study transthyretin associated amyloidosis. So, um, we know that, that it's heterogeneous, even though it's caused by mutations in a single gene, it's heterogeneous in its presentation. Uh, different onset, different organs are impacted. Um, there's little evidence, there's little data on natural history, comorbidities, progression, et cetera. And then we know there's a variety of treatments, whether it be supportive, organ transplant, or other therapeutic interventions that address either the cardiomyopathies or the neuro pathologies. We've been performing genetic testing for the TTR gene in our diagnostic laboratory for about a decade uh, as part of a cardiomyopathy panel. And this is uh, some of the data that we have. We, we classify the variants that we see from benign, no evidence of pathology, to a variant of unspecified significance, to one that's highly associated with a pathogenic uh, pathogenic evidence from the clinical literature. In that data, in the last eight or 10 years, we've identified 50 unique mutations within the transthyretin gene. We have 160 some patients that have more than one mutation within the gene. So it gives us an opportunity to leverage that data to establish genotype phenotype correlations and then associate it with other lab data to identify co comorbidities, and even to look at natural history of disease. So here's an example on the left is a histogram that shows the distribution of the genetic variants identified in the transthyretin gene. We've got demographics in the right-hand panels on age, where the diagnosis was made, um, uh, gender, male-female uh, distribution, and then across the bottom are different symptomologies and the frequency with which a mutation is de detected associated with that symptomology. Here are examples of some genotype phenotype insights. So if we look, uh, we look at all of the different phenotypic characteristics from a cardiomyopathy to evidence of amyloidosis to renal disease to um, heart failure, et cetera. And in the columns uh, with the green and the yellow colors, are we have pathogenic variants for cardiomyopathy. We have benign or variants of unknown significance. We have benign variants not reported to be associated with uh, pathology in the literature and then others. And what you can see here is it's not, even those that are associated with a heart condition also show up with other comorbidities like kidney function, et cetera. So we've started to look at this longitudinally. This is one example where we have a cohort of patients with a given genetic variant, and this is their estimated glomular filtration rate over time with longitudinal data. And you can see some patients uh, have a decreasing function, some are stable, et cetera. If you look at that for a single patient, this is uh, interesting data. Um, we start again at age 29 through age 35, so six years of lab data. Initially, they presented with fatigue, nondescript uh, phenotype, and then at about age 31, they, had, they, they showed renal disease. They had a genetic test for transthyretin, 
a pathogenic mutation associated with her, the cardiomyopathy. If you look in the second panel, those are all of the ICD-10 codes that are in our system. So initially, they were being evaluated for, liver or for kidney function. Then it moved over into neuropathy. Then it all moved over into heart function, et cetera. So you see over the course of time, initial presentation of symptomology, a genetic diagnosis, and then the downstream comorbidity is associated with that. And then the third panel is the estimated um, glomerular filtration rate for this patient with decreasing function of the kidney over time. So again, and then uh, coexisting uh, po conditions within populations. And so here's after a genetic diagnosis. Again, these panels are offered for patients being evaluated for cardiomyopathy. And what we see across this, is you all also see other coexisting conditions. Uh, mainly kidney function and other uh, neuropathologies. So longitudinal data, so I've got two slides, I'm wrapping it up. Used for a variety of things. So um, real world evidence, real world, world natural history data, also potentially as synthetic control arms in a study, the broader the data set becomes. Retrospective, prospective, or even to look for potential adverse events, looking at what we see in the real world as a map of what we might expect in a trial setting. So we continue to look for other ways to leverage this data in natural history studies. Uh, we're looking to expand that further for other conditions, looking for genotype, phenotype insi uh, insights, leveraging machine learning to take a look at this, this large database to see what more we can leverage from that. But again, still there are gaps to, to, uh, to, that need to be filled. And those include how do you leverage this uh, for synthetic control arms and other ways in the clinical trial setting. And with that, I'll stop, and uh, I think I've run over my time, so I'll answer any questions at the back of the room or over a cup of coffee. So thank you. <laughs>